Welcome to Cutline in the Community, Justice Now, in search of common ground on criminal justice reform. Sponsored by Fairfield University's Master of Public Administration program and in partnership with Connecticut Public. I am Dr. Gail Alberta, an Associate Professor of Politics and Director of the MPA program. Since the murder of George Floyd, there has been an increase in calls for criminal justice reforms. Recently, Connecticut has passed several laws on this topic, including expanding ballot access to people on parole, abolishing prison gerrymandering, allowing free phone calls from prison, banning chokeholds, whistleblower protections to report excessive use of force, requiring uniformed officers to have their names and badge numbers visible on all outer garments, body and dash cameras for any officer interacting with the public, and enacting clean slate laws, as well as time limitations that an incarcerated person can be held in isolated confinement. Tonight, our bipartisan panel will dive into what's next for criminal justice reform. With me is State Senator Heron Gaston from the 23rd State Senate District, representing parts of Bridgeport and Stratford. He is the senior pastor of Summerfield United Methodist Church in Bridgeport. Senator Gaston received his doctorate degree from Yale University, a law degree from Quinnipiac University, and holds four master's degrees, two from Florida A&M University and two from Yale University. Welcome, Senator. Gail, thanks so much for having me. Next is State Representative Greg Howard from the 43rd Assembly District, representing Stonington, North Stonington, and Ledger. He is a detective with the Stonington Police Department. Representative Howard currently holds an EMT certification as well as an EMS instructor certification. Welcome, Representative. Hi, Gail. Thank you for having me. Finally is Reverend Dr. Charlie Stallworth, a faculty member at Fairfield University's MPA program. Prior to this position, he was a state representative for six terms, representing Bridgeport. He is also the senior pastor of the East End Baptist Tabernacle Church in Bridgeport. Dr. Stallworth received his Doctorate of Ministry degree from the United Theological Seminary and his Master of Divinity degree from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Abroad, it's good to be here. So can each of you share, what is your connection with criminal justice? Um, so my criminal justice background started very early on as a teenager. Uh, I formerly served as the youth branch president for the NAACP in the state of Florida and in Haines City in particular. I also worked in a lobbying firm around criminal justice reform in Tallahassee, Florida at uh, uh, Public Affairs Consultants. And then I also uh, served on uh, the social status of black men and boys uh, through the uh, Charlie Chris administration, uh, who was the governor of Florida uh, back in 2009. Uh, and then I also worked at the Florida Department of Corrections in the area of reentry. Uh, and uh, help to protest the Stand Your Ground law uh, against the slaying of Trayvon Martin uh, with George Zimmerman. So I have a long history of working around criminal justice reform and currently I serve as the police chaplain for the Bridgeport Police Department. Representative? Um, so my life work has been around criminal justice. Um, I, started a, uh, I started in public service at the age of 14 working in EMS um, and then at the age of 22 became a police officer where I've served for the last 21 years. Um, the last seven as a detective, I've been a canine handler, I've been a uh, crisis intervention officer, working with mentally, uh, mentally ill individuals on calls, and I've also been a, a field training officer and police instructor as well. Um, and then when I, when I decided to run for the state legislature, I've been serving the public safety community, uh, public safety committee as the ranking member, and also with the um, judiciary committee. Um, extensive training in, in laws of arrest, uh, laws of evidence, search and seizure, and certainly use of force. So. Um, Literally, my, my entire life's adult life has been dedicated to the criminal justice system. And Dr. Stallworth? Yes, uh, criminal justice is part of my DNA. My father was on the tail end of the civil rights movement, and that has just been nurtured throughout my entire life. And now as a senior pastor, I'm going to court with people who have had to face the criminal justice system. Uh, I've been a professor here at this wonderful institution. I have the chance to engage in wonderful minds and discussion. I've uh, been a former politician. Uh, I made laws concerning criminal justice and just as a person, wanting equality for all people. So when we think of criminal justice, a few things typically come to mind, such as prisons, crime, police. Uh, 
inequality, racism, reform is a big term today. So I want to begin by asking this larger, more theoretical you know, question. Why is criminal justice so imperative? Dr. Stallworth, I'm going to start with you. When I was growing up, and I mentioned growing up, growing up in a small southern, southern town, and I remember as a kid, a police officer, a white police officer, had shot an unarmed black man. And the community had no hope that anything would be done. And now here we are many more years later, and we're still fighting uh, the same fight. So I believe it's imperative because you cannot look over one aspect of the community and expect for the entire community to, to grow and to you know, be a vibrant place for everybody. I'll pivot to either one of you if you would like to. I'll go. Um, so, you know, law enforcement is is an important part of the community. You know, law enforcement is the first line of defense for 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 a community. Um, you know, they obviously not only enforce laws that we pass in Hartford, you know, to protect other members of, of the community, but also uh, a community caretaker function. I think it's overlooked. You know, and, and police officers. Uh, I, I worked with an old police officer one time and said the police department is the miscellaneous department. We handle what nobody else does. And in, in, in effect, we do that oftentimes by nature of the fact that we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to, to individual citizens who need help. So when we talk about criminal justice reform, and as, as Dr. Stallworth said here, you know, when there's a mistrust of, of law enforcement, a lot of resources get dedicated to trying to overcome that. Um, so that takes away from resources of protecting the community. So that's why, you know, rebuilding that trust and, and having that trust inherent is super important. And in addition to that, when there is that lack of trust, the job becomes exponentially more difficult. Uh, you know, right now in the state of Connecticut, we're seeing individuals who are going around and, you know, videotaping in public buildings, as an example, to bait police officers into some sort of a confrontation. That takes that resource away, and then there's a lot of reporting aspects and stuff. So those sort of things that happen are taking away from the core uh, mission, which is to serve the public and protect them. So I think it's important we have these conversations that we get to a place where the community trusts the police, the law enforcement knows their, their role and, and the, the restrictions of their roles and, and the, the ramifications of, of, of misrepresenting that role uh, to really get the job done effectively for the betterment of all. Thank you. I think that in order to talk about uh, criminal justice reform, we have to have the very honest conversation around ori uh, America's original sin, around racism, uh, and the systemic issues that I think uh, that have been brought to bear in terms of the over-policing uh, in certain communities that have created uh, this mistrust uh, between law enforcement and the communities that they uh, serve. And so one of the things I think that is important to talk about is the social conundrums of uh, poor communities of color, especially those communities sort of being exacted upon by having an over-police presence uh, in those communities historically and what that has meant in terms of uh, people's understanding of the functionality of police officers being guardians opposed to being uh, something to be uh, feared. And so I think it's very important to sort of uh, understand uh, the history of policing because if we don't understand our history, we don't understand our past. If we don't understand our past, we don't understand our present. And if we don't understand our present, we cannot understand our future. And so I think um, right now we are in a unique opportunity uh, to really address some of the systemic issues uh, that have uh, plagued our communities uh, for, for many decades uh, and getting to a point now where we can understand each other uh, and have very honest and open, transparent conversations in order to help move our communities forward and move our society forward. You know, what excites me about what you all just said is that we're going to dive into all of this stuff tonight, right? We're going to talk a little bit more about you know, how communities of color might view this. We're going to talk a lot about trust and what kind of resources officers do need, um, as well as some of the historical aspects, right, like Dr. Stallworth, you were saying. So before we dive into all of that, I have been, you know, watching some of the activity in, the, in Hartford. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the bills that you guys have worked on, um, both independently and collectively. So first, I'm going to start with you, Senator. Uh, you recently um, introduced a bill that would alter a current piece of um, legislation or current act um, that would prohibit um, any law enforcement agency from stopping, detaining, searching any motorist just solely on things like race, color, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, right? That's currently how the law reads. You were uh, you proposed a bill that took that a step further that suggested that they also need to tell someone when they pull them over, like verbally explain why. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you offered that bill up? Absolutely. Um, you know, all too often I've experienced the ease with which uh, black men who look like me uh, fall under the crushing yoke of injustice by a uh, prejudicial and biased uh, criminal justice system. And as a African-American male uh, who lives in an inner city and who um, have far often been pulled over uh, by law enforcement and the level of treatment uh, that I've received in certain municipalities over other municipalities, um, I thought that it's mission critical um, for the safety and the livelihood of individuals behind the wheel that they're protected. And so um, I uh, worked in a bipartisan fashion with some of my colleagues, including uh, Representative Hi Howard, who's here, uh, to talk about ways in which we can uh, make this bill uh, something that uh, is not an indictment tool on police because we recognize the hard work that police officers do each and every day, putting on that uniform and protecting and serving the lives of those that they're uh, looking after in this state. But we also recognize on the flip side of that that not every uh, motorist receives the same kind of treatment. And so what we want to do is standardize that process by uh, ensuring that when a motorist is pulled over, uh, that from the very inception of that stop, uh, that we can create a harmonious uh, relationship between the motorist and the law enforcement official and not create a situation of tension at the onset. Most folks are going to ask the question, why am I being pulled over? And so uh, I know that Post University uh, does training around uh, interactions between police officers when they pull someone over, and most police officers do tell people why they're being stopped. Uh, but that is not a standardized practice across uh, our state, and so I just want to ensure that uh, places like Greenwich and Fairfield uh, and Stonington and uh, other uh, cities around uh, this state are treating folks the, the very same way that folks in Waterbury uh, should be doing in the police departments in Bridgeport and Stanford. And so that's what really um, got me uh, behind this bill. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Senator Alvin Penn, the late Senator Alvin Penn served uh, in the seat that I currently occupy uh, legislator from Bridgeport and Stratford, and he was pulled over uh, one night uh, coming uh, from legislative session, I believe, in Stratford, and uh, that's how the uh, initial Alvin Penn bill came about. But that bill did not take it uh, to the step to where we need to be now, and the step that I wanted to add to that is ensuring that people know why they're being stopped, at least before the conclusion. Of the, uh, of the stop. One of the other bills that I want to just talk about real quick, um, Representative, is your bill that deals with, I believe, searches of cars, right? Consent Asking searches. for consent, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, prior to the Police Accountability Bill of 2020, law enforcement officers in this state and throughout the United States were able to, on a, on a motor vehicle stop, solicit consent. They could say to an operator, uh, do you mind if I search your vehicle? Certainly if the individual, the operator said, no, you may not, they cannot search the vehicle. Um, the Police Accountability Bill in 2020 made that illegal the officer can no longer do that. Um, in fact, the police bill in 2020 also made it illegal to ask an individual for consent to search them. When I came to legislature in 2021 with my experience, I said, hey, this is a real problem, and let me explain why. Uh, first of all, the search of a person is a problem because if Senator Gaston is a victim of a burglary and I were to get uh, DNA samples, say, from the point of entry and to submit them to the lab, I need what we call exemplars. So I need to ask Senator Gaston, hey, may I you know, swab the inside of your mouth? That's a consent search. I have to ask him to do that to get a job done. The way we do narcotics interdiction uh, with, with confidential informants buys, you're doing a consent search. Um, so I came back to legislature in 2021. My colleagues and I came to an agreement. And what I said was, I understand. I understand, I understand what the senator just said on car stops, and I understand the, the intent of the 2020 bill. So what I offered was, um, when an officer has reasonable suspicion, which is a lower threshold to probable cause, they should be able to solicit consent. What that does is it stops you, an officer from asking just black people or asking everybody for consent, but says when you have a reason, or in the case of a person, what I, the way we word it was to further an ongoing police investigation, uh, you could solicit consent. And that bill came out of the Judiciary Committee bipartisan. Um, unfortunately, when it made it to the Senate in 2021, the Senate amended the bill uh, and the, the reinstitution of asking a person stayed in the bill and that passed, so we sort of fixed that, if you will. But the vehicle uh, reinstitution came out in the Senate. And so as it sits today, an officer can't do that. And why is that important? Um, catalytic converter thefts happening rampant in our state. 
Uh, in Stonington, the bus garage is at the end of a cul-de-sac. And uh, all the school buses are outside, uh, oftentimes, and naturally they have catalytic converters underneath them. If a police officer in Stonington is patrolling at 2.30 in the morning and sees a vehicle coming off of that road and stops the car, and there's no real legitimate reason to be down there, that's not probable cause to search the car. But it's enough reasonable suspicion when the officer knows what's down there, knows there's no legitimate reason to be down at that time of night, knows about the catalytic converter thefts, the officer should be able to say, may I search your vehicle? We also put in the law when we came out, and again, that, that one did not make it all the way through, but what I have currently before the legislature says that an officer, whether consent is granted or not, has to report it. And naturally, it's all caught on body camera. So we can see that the, the, the consent was you know, voluntary, et cetera, which is all required. Um, and we can also track you know, who, which officers are asking for consent under what circumstances. So certainly if you have an officer who is you know, finding reasonable suspicion with only black operators, you can deal with that officer because that, that documentation is there. But it's an important tool in law enforcement to combat not just, not just catalytic converter thefts, narcotic interdiction, firearm interdiction. Probable cause is a reasonable, um, excuse me, probable cause is a standard that would lead a reasonable person to believe something. Reasonable suspicion, the courts have defined as a, uh, a lower standard, which is facts and circumstances will lead a reasonable officer based on his training experience. So the average person may look in the back of a car and see a little rose and some chore boy and say, well, that's nothing. And perhaps you're saying to yourself, okay, that's yeah, nothing. But a law enforcement officer knows that those little roses come out of a crack pipe and chore boy is used for that. So that should be enough for an officer to say, hey, may I search your car? because they have that training experience. So I, I think that there's, and we have to talk about to delineating between police accountability and police restrictions. Police accountability is holding officers accountable when they do it wrong. Putting restrictions on good officers trying to do a good job so much that they can't get the job done is detrimental to the public safety. And I think consent search is a great example of that. Let's take a deeper look into criminal justice in our state. Here's a question submitted by Fairfield University faculty member, Aaron Weinstein. My name is Aaron Weinstein, and I'm Assistant Professor of Politics here at Fairfield. I'm wondering if you can help me interpret some of Connecticut's crime statistics. It seems to me like it's a tale of two cities. On the one hand, we seem to be like that shining city on a hill. Connecticut ranks as the fifth safest state in the nation, is in the top 15 lowest crime rate, and is in the top 10 for lowest imprisoned rate. But on the other hand, not everyone inhabits that shining city. Connecticut has some of the highest income inequality in the nation. It also has the fifth highest black-white incarceration disparity and the second largest Latinx-white disparity. My question is this. Is Connecticut doing as well as those overall crime statistics would suggest? Or is the state so unequal that it's impossible for us to read anything into the overall statistics at all? If so, how does this affect the kinds of policy that we ought to pursue? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Aaron. So to the panel, what can we make of those statistics? What kind of policies does that suggest we need? need? We're doing really well on one hand and then maybe not so well on the other. I agree, it is the tale of two cities. Uh, what goes on in Bridgeport is not what goes on in Greenwich. And whether it's Gandhi or whether it's Humphrey, uh, it depends on how you treat the most vulnerable in your society. Uh, it's going to be the sum total of what happens to the entire community. Uh, I believe that's some of the historical fight we've been fighting for a while to say uh, that things are not equal. Representative Howard, who's a great person, great off officer, uh, when he talks about a reasonable search, I trust that with him. Uh, but I don't trust that with all uh, officers. Uh, Chris Rock, who's a comedian, said something that is <laughs> just so profound. He said, in some professions, we can't have bad apples. Delta can't say, you know, we got a few bad pilots who just like crashing planes. And so I think in some professions, we have to make sure that we have a quality uh, of people so that the justice you get in Greenwich is the same justice you get in Bridgeport. As a pastor, I stood with uh, young people in court uh, who got into a fight uh, at a club with some uh, white persons. The white kids went home. The black kids went to jail. And so it is a tale of two cities. And I think the stats uh, bear that out uh, where it is good in some places, more challenging than other places. When we talk a lot about, you know, these statistics, is it the statistics that are the concern or perhaps is it that, you know, there are other issues that kind of lead to this, right? We know, for instance, that 
um, arrest rates are correlated with things like, you know, uh, income inequality, for instance, um, educational inequalities. So is the, the fix looking at things like criminal justice reform, police reform, um, what have you, or is it really kind of deep diving the deeper wound, right, of fixing maybe how the, the resources that are offered to certain right, communities that just happen to be either underrepresented or under-resourced? You know, when folks say stay, stay statistics like that, um, I think too many people like to jump and say, well, it's because the police are racist. And I, I, do we have racist police officers? Sure. Uh, you know, Dr. Stowers said we, you know, certain professions can't have bad apples. Listen, none of us have a crystal ball, you know, um, but this profession, and, I, and folks should know this too, to, to jo join the profession of law enforcement in this state, you go through a rigorous process. Inequities exist not just in the criminal justice system, they exist in kindergarten readiness, they exist in poverty, they exist in housing, they exist in healthcare. So what we passed was a commission, we, we created a commission to investigate and make recommendations to alleviate all of those inequities, because I think you're right. Uh, I think that in large part, and I'm not going to sit here and say there's not anomalies, but in large part, I think that the inequities that exist in the criminal justice system are the fruit of a different tree. And, you know, we are working in the state of Connecticut to address all of those underlying concerns um, to, and hopefully to find a, a more balanced Connecticut that works for everybody. Uh, and, and again, back to my original point, what happens next? Then we won't be jumping to say, well, our police officers are all racist. And, and then and law enforcement will, won't have that obstacle to overcome anymore and get back to doing the important work that they do, which is why this conversation is important. Uh, one of the things that I'll say is that uh, someone said it much more profound, that when you look at the criminal justice system, you see just us. Uh, African Americans make up over 13 percent of the general population, but make up overwhelmingly uh, the jail and prison population across our country, regardless of what state uh, you look at, you'll see that disparity. If you look at the state of Connecticut, for example, in 2020, there was a Connecticut Post article that indicated that African Americans make up less than 10 percent of the Connecticut general population, but yet made up over 42.9 percent of the jail and prison population, with the Hispanic population being at 26.4 percent and the white population being over 62 percent of our adults that live in this state are white, uh, made up less than 30 percent of our jail and prison population. And while we have made some significant gains in our state around criminal justice reform and helping to close down prison, we have not created pipelines and opportunity and pathways for people to be successful and to really address the systemic issue of poverty in our community. And that there is a correlation between poverty and crime. We know that education is the bridge to the future. It is the cornerstone by which our success so heavily depends upon. And when you have school districts across our state, school districts like Bridgeport, that is consistently underfunded by over $50 million a year. And we expect for those students to uh, be on par with students from places like Fairfield. We're doing a disservice. We have to be able to address the educational disparity uh, that exists in our communities, early childhood education, making more investments there. Uh, it's not a one size fit all. In fact, it's almost like peeling an onion. The deeper and deeper you dig, the more stinkier and multi-layered it is. But all of those things happen as a byproduct of America's original sin of racism and systemic failures on addressing these issues. I'm so excited that in 2023, we are beginning to have the honest conversation, but we must level the playing field. and We must create more opportunities for our young people. It's not just a police issue, but what we do know is that when people come in contact with law enforcement, oftentimes have a, as a juvenile, they later graduate into the larger criminal justice system and they walk around with a scarlet letter and many times they are resigned not just to a working class community, they are resigned to an, a permanent underclass system that perpetuates throughout their lifespan. They cannot get employment, they cannot get decent wages, they cannot provide for themselves and their families and so we have to be able to address uh, all of these issues simultaneously um, but uh, with uh, delicacy uh, being meticulous and methodical in the way in which we uh, move forward. So. so I want to turn now to gun violence. So a major issue in the U.S., as we know, is gun violence. So research shows that violent crime and gun violence are positively correlated. Gun violence also has a disproportionate impact on people of color and is highly concentrated in historically under-resourced neighborhoods. So for instance, in 2020, 
12.5% of the U.S. population identified as black, and 61% of gun homicide victims were also black. Since 2020, firearms are the leading cause of death among children. This is higher than traffic fatalities and cancer. And mass shootings are becoming more frequent. The total number of mass shootings this year is 172, which resulted in 225 deaths and over 6,000 injuries. On April 15th, we experienced the highest number of mass shootings in one day, seven. There's a piece of legislation that you both supported in your committee that is regarding community roundtables and funding of community policing programs to combat gun violence. One of the things that you mentioned earlier, Representative, was this connection with trust. I'm wondering if that bill is one that might help increase that trust or maybe if there was a different purpose for that bill. The, the original bill said that every community had to have these roundtables. And when I went back to the center and said, listen, you know, there's a lot of communities that have zero gun violence. And, you know, to take those resources and make them have this, this meeting when there isn't any isn't the best use of resources. And he said, you know, you're right. And what did we do there? We both came with our individual perspectives and we reached a solution that worked for everybody. And that's exactly what the roundtable will do. The idea behind the roundtable is to have members of the community, members of law enforcement, and all interested parties, you know, the executive branches of, the, of the, that particular community, come and say, what is the root cause? So you pointed out some statistics around race. So again, I'm going to say, I don't think that every shooter is a racist uh, when we talk about gun violence. I think that for socioeconomic reasons, historical and socioeconomic reasons, gun violence is more prevalent in those communities. And that's something that those individual communities can address um, on, on a community community basis with all the interested parties giving their perspective and coming to a solution similar to the way Senator Gass and I did on this particular bill. And the reason that you know, we worked hard on this and I think it's such a great bill is because oftentimes folks want to jump to blame the gun. You know, and, and here in Connecticut we had, you know, depending what metric you use, first, second, or third most restrictive gun laws in our country by state. And you know, individuals think, well, we need to do something about gun violence because of the statistics that you laid out. Um, and, and here in Connecticut, I think that our, our gun laws are as restrictive as they need to be, and I would not move to make them any more restrictive. In fact, I think we need to really get to the, to the heart of the problem. Uh, four of our major city mayors have recently come together and said the issue is not gun control. The issue is criminals possessing firearms. So that's what we need to drill down on. I uh, was envisioning this bill uh, very early on as one of its original architects, and I uh, do believe in bipartisan uh, support, um, as I know that this issue uh, impacts uh, all communities as I think our society has a over uh, with guns and we have to be able to uh, disrupt uh, that pipeline especially uh, guns being used um, and infiltrated in uh, poor communities of color. Uh, just in Bridgeport uh, we uh, have an issue with gun violence and it's not because everybody in the community is using guns it's uh, in the hands of those individuals who are wreaking havoc on the community. We need to make sure that we're working hand in glove with law enforcement and our other community partners uh, to identify who these folks are. We do want to um, help organizations that are uh, working with our young people and deterring them from street violence and pivoting them towards uh, education or vocational tracks uh, because we do understand the importance of education. And the more educated the population is, oftentimes the less street level violence and crime that we see. And so we're trying to really put all of our resources together uh, to ensure that uh, not just uh, our smaller towns are safe, but that our inner cities are also safe in places where people feel they want to grow their families. So I want to turn our attention now uh, quickly to a law that was enacted uh, this year in January 1st, the you know clean slate law. Um, so under this law, old and low-level criminal records are automatically erased if you qualify. You qualify if you hadn't had a criminal conviction for over seven years and you have finished ser serving all criminal sentences. So my question is, kind of thinking about how this law will impact us moving forward, is what do we think this law um, impact it will have on employers and their hiring practices and employment in general? I think first intrinsic in this law is the state saying, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't get it right the first time. <laughs> and knowing that some people have received a longer sentence or received a sentence at all uh, because of other social reasons. Uh, so I think that's the first thing that this law does is to say, this is an attempt to get it right. 
I hope uh, employers uh, do not take the approach they did with Band of the Box. They discovered another way uh, to find out if you had, you know, the F on your chest. Uh, they find out another way. And so I hope this effort uh, is put forth in such a way that employers are put on, on check, that they're put on notice, uh, that this is not a way to go out and find uh, information in different ways uh, to stop people from having opportunity. Because Everybody needs a second chance, another chance. I guess I messed up my second chance five seconds after I was born. But all of us need another opportunity, another chance. So I'm excited about this law. I've already been asked uh, by some persons to help in the process. And so I am excited. I, I believe it's a good law. It's good for the state. So I, I, you know, Dr. Stolworth and I, when he was up there, we disagreed on this law. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, bad apples. And, and I talked about the extensive process by which one must go through to become a law enforcement officer. Uh, and there are other professions that, you know, your, your past can be indicative of your character, can be indicative of your future. Um, and, you know, certainly a lot of low-level offenses, I think, in our current workforce, uh, I think everybody is trying to find anybody they can that can pass a drug test, for example. I, I, I have contractors tell me all the time, if I can find somebody that will show up in the morning and pass a drug test, I'll hire them. I don't care what they've done. Um, you know, so the bill is a bit too expansive for me. But, again, in a bipartisan effort at, in 2020, uh, 22 when we – 22? When we passed that, I forget now. Um, yeah, um, one of those years, we, uh, you know, we, we did take work together and take a lot of offenses out, and I got to a much better place. Um, but you know, yeah, I think the clean slate is a step in the right direction uh, towards criminal justice reform. I think that in our country in general, we've seen that in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, we saw the three, three strike, you're out rule. Uh, we saw that we were really tough on crime, uh, the war on crime, also the war on drugs. And what we've noticed is the over-sentencing of certain individuals uh, in certain communities. And I think that we have sort of are learning from uh, our mistakes on a national level. Uh, and then we also are looking at the state level in the review mirror and say, you know, um, uh, did we do, were we too punitive? Um, are we a system um, that uh, does not restore or rehabilitate? And I think that as uh, the research show, uh, that individuals are likely to come out of prison at some point and we have to ensure that we rehabilitate them and get them to be prepared to be productive members of our society. And this would give these individuals an opportunity to really pick themselves up, dust themselves off, uh, and get a clean slate and a new start. So I want to turn our attention to another question that we have. Isabel is a politics major at Fairfield University and she has this question about our criminal justice system. It is clear that our criminal justice system needs massive change, but that's going to take time. Are there smaller changes you think can be made that will hopefully have a large impact? If so, what barriers have been preventing these changes in the past? Thanks, Isabel. Representative Howard, let's start with you. What are some small changes that we can make? So I think, you know, one of the biggest issues, and, and Dr. Stoworth and, and both, both my colleagues here have, have, have mentioned this earlier, the tale of two cities. And what I found in my time in the legislature is we, we pass sweeping legislation because something is not working well in Bridgeport, rather than say, okay, well, it's working great in Stonington, let's, let's expand upon that, we become restrictive on Stonington. Um, that's really not the way to, to affect change. Uh, you know, school resource officers is a, is a classic example of this. Uh, I happened to be working an overtime job just yesterday where I was at one of our elementary schools. Now, most of these kids um, have never seen me in uniform before. I get nothing but hugs coming through that door. First, second, third graders run up to me, and I have colleagues in the legislature who tell me that police officers in school are intimidating to children. Well, that's not happening in many towns. And we need to in, it, it create a community where law enforcement officers are part of the community on a larger basis. And do they, does it mean they have to live there? Not necessarily. Certainly that's much more convenient. It makes it easier. But to enable them to get out of the car and walk around and interact with their community. And in order to do that, we have to do a few things. One. We have to stop overwhelming them with trying to overcome the obstacles that we've now created. And we also need to start to limit a little bit what we have our law enforcement officers doing. So their community interaction is getting more and more limited to only responding to major emergencies or major incidents where people are in crisis. That is not the best way to do things. Uh, if we're going to overcome that trust, uh, that trust barrier and regain that trust, we need to allow our law enforcement officers to go out and engage their community on the regular. I think it's important and mission critical. Uh, that uh, law enforcement uh, who are policing uh, communities, especially certain communities where there is an issue of distrust between law enforcement and the community, that our police forces also reflect uh, the demographics 
of those respective communities. Um, I do have a problem when law enforcement officials uh, get off of Route 8, drive into Bridgeport, uh, have on that uniform, stay there for eight hours or however long, get off their shift and go to a different community altogether. I do believe that um, you can still be a great officer without having to live in the community, but what I do know is that when you live in a community, when you breathe the same air, when you are involved in the same level of conditions of that community, you tend to have a stronger investment in that community. So real quick, I want to turn, and I'll, I'll come to you, Dr. Stallworth, here in a second. I want to turn real quickly to uh, a task force that was enacted in the legislature, the Police Accountability um, and Transparency Task Force. They made a couple of recommendations, and one of them that not pulling folks over uh, for secondary offenses. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, because um, you guys are bringing some really interesting perspectives to the table. And I'll start with you, Dr. Stallworth. Um, would something like that be helpful? Is that a, one of these small changes, or is that not where our focus should be? Since 2017, 600 people have been killed by police officers that initiated with a traffic stop. 2015, the, uh, 20, uh, 2021, a quarter of the black persons killed, it was initiated by a traffic stop. I understand you don't want a light out, maybe someone cannot see, but the flip side of that is the negativity that's growing out of that is destroying a society. So I want to turn our attention really quickly to juvenile criminal justice. And we're going to begin this conversation um, from a question that was submitted by another Fairfield student, Callie, who is a marketing major here. How can we ensure that young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system receive adequate resources and support to prevent future involvement in the criminal justice system? So who would like to start? What kind of resources can we give our youth so that they don't reoffend? Well, I think first of all, it's to understand that the system is broken. Uh, in my uh, class uh, this semester, one of the sources I used really had to do with healthcare. Uh, Dr. Miani, who who's, uh, has this composition on confessions of a black female surgeon that talks about the racism that's embedded in the health system. The system is broken. It's the same with our criminal justice system, especially when it comes to our young people. It is broken. If one's brain is not completely rewired, as they say, until age 25, why are we not treating persons uh, with that reference, that science uh, in mind? And so I think we have to put more resources in, especially more community resources. There are programs I know in Bridgeport, like VIP and other programs that would be far more productive than incarcerating someone and have a far greater impact. And so I believe there are some things that we can do uh, to help our young people, but we have to understand that the system is broken. And to keep doing what we're doing, we're just working with a broken system. There's another question from a student, very similar question and topic, but I want to definitely make sure that they also have their question heard. So the second question comes from Catherine. Uh, she's an accounting and finance double major here at Fairfield. What are some successful community-based alternatives to detention that have been implemented in other states or countries? And how can these approaches be scaled up to have a greater impact on reducing juvenile incarceration rates? All right, so not only what are the resources, but also what do we know that works? Like, can we beg, borrow, and steal from other places that have had some programs that have been successful? So I'll say this, um, you know, everybody wants the, you know, the magic wand, and, and sometimes we have to face reality. And the reality is that we're always going to have people who commit crime. I wish it wasn't the case, believe me, but that is a fact. Um, and you can give certain individuals all the resources and opportunities that they want, that you want to give them, if they're not going to take advantage of them because that's what they're going to do. That is a harsh reality. Um, when you talk about juvenile uh, crime, and, and Dr. Stolo said the system is broken, the system is broken, and it's probably always going to be broken. And the reason is because you are never going to solve everything. You are never going to get gun violence to zero. You're never going to get juvenile crime to zero. The reality is every kid's situation is different. Um, some people commit crimes for, and, and we've talked about this at length, because of uh, environmental reasons, socioeconomic reasons. Some people commit crimes because it's sort of, um, you know, uh, in their DNA. They're, they're just a violent person. Uh, those, those individuals exist. When we talk about kids, we really have to drill down 
early on and see red flags even sooner than we are, and we know what they are. We know when a kid stops coming to school, they need intervention. Uh, we know when, it, when a kid starts hanging around with the wrong people, they need intervention. The fact of the matter is our juvenile justice system um, in all of the alcohol alphabet soup of agencies that are involved of, in our juveniles, uh, first of all, need to communicate better. But the reality is we have to give all of those programs from the juvenile court on all, uh, a, a wide net to cast. We have to give them, I don't want to use the word authority, but we have to give them a, a great array of tools at their disposal. You know, to invest in a child when they're headed down a bad path at 11 or 12 is significantly cheaper than if they send down that path and you continue with them in the criminal justice system and incarceration and public defenders and, and, and on. So if you are an individual who looks at it from a monetary standpoint instead of a humanitarian standpoint, it's still beneficial to hit these kids young. But I'll tell you what, one of the biggest gatekeepers to most of those programs, law enforcement. And when my, my colleagues want to limit the way in which um, law enforcement can interact with those kids and get them into those systems and into those pretrial diversionary programs that have, have by the way, low recidivism rates and high success rates, um, again, I, I question, I say, what, if, if, if the juvenile justice system has these low recidivism rates and the high success, and the police officers, the gatekeepers, and why are you trying to keep the police officers from getting kids into it? Well, we don't want them arrested. They're re, it's not an arrest, they're, re, they're referred to juvenile court. Uh, so this is the problem where we work against ourselves up there, and, and that's where it gets frustrating. I think we need to overcome that. Senator, I want to ask you, just to piggyback all of all of this, so what can we do to reduce juvenile reoffending? Let me just say this. It's cheaper to send a student to Yale than to send them to jail. So we have to be able to make uh, investments in our young people. I do believe in the uh, diversionary programs uh, to divert young people from the criminal justice system uh, by uh, investing in community programs like uh, Dr. Stallworth mentioned, VIP along with others. Uh, that gives students the opportunity uh, to turn from uh, the street and go into a successful pathway. Um, and I think that all of our young people um, deserve the um, equitable opportunity to have the same kind of resources uh, distributed to them. But to your last question, what was it? What can we do to help them not reoffend? Yeah, so some of the things I think that we can do to help them not reoffend is engage in uh, mentoring and credible messengers. You know, other young people who have gotten into issues in the past and uh, now they're on the straight and narrow, you know, pairing them with their peers and saying, hey, you know, you're young, you're likely to be rambunctious, you're likely to make, um, you know, certain kinds of decisions. But this is the way that I kind of overcame this. This is the way that I came out of this. Um, so I think consistent mentoring. I also think uh, intervention with engagement with family members as well. So you can't just address the student. Uh, sometime without addressing uh, the parental or uh, the guardian uh, being involved in that process as well and putting the resources where they need to be to ensure that it's being reinforced, uh, not just in the school setting, but also reinforced uh, in the home setting as well. So creating opportunities for parents to grow alongside uh, their young people, I think, is uh, a step in the right direction and one uh, good start to diminishing the crime. So I'm going to shift gears almost completely for a second. So the political scientist in me can't not talk about, cannot not talk about um, incarcerated voting. We know that disenfranchisement is a long history in the U.S., but we also know that only two states do have this. Do we adopt it? Do we not? Why? You know, the whole idea that you can lose your right to vote to me is just mind-blowing. Uh, I attended an undergrad school in Selma, Alabama, and each day I rode across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge and to remember how people fought to have the right to vote. There's a larger evil, <laughs> if I can use that terminology. I think evil, I'm not calling people evil, <laughs> but there's a larger evil at work when we take someone's basic right from them uh, that should be given to us as an American citizen. If one does not register to vote, that's one thing. But to take someone's right to vote is just mind-blowing to me. Uh, it, it smells like Jim Crow. It smells like slavery, a kind of a second-class citizen. And once, uh, I don't have to worry about this now, but once legislators know uh, that these persons who are incarcerated have a vote, uh, I just believe that they would give more attention uh, to uh, 
to rehabilitate uh, those persons to make them productive uh, citizens and not create this not create this permanent underclass. And so I believe um, Connecticut should make great strides. I remember uh, when I was a legislator and the gerrymandering thing was, was, was big and where persons won't count inmates in their city to get funded, uh, but those same persons sometimes do not want to count them to get votes. And so the whole idea of being able to lose one vote to me is just is, is, is mind blowing. It's, it's an American right. I would also agree with that. I think it's a basic fundamental right that uh, human beings have, uh, the ability to be able to engage in their democracy and to help um, select uh, folks to represent them. We know that politics is the process by which we choose our elected officials and hold them accountable to the constituents they represent. When we have voter suppression and people's voice are quelled and they cannot um, lift up their voices, uh, we do know that um, individuals oftentimes um, feel hopeless. And uh, one of the NAACP slogans is a uh, hopeless people, a voteless people is a hopeless people. And when people feel that their back is against the wall, they're hopeless, uh, they feel they've lost everything else. And one of the things that people do have is a voice. Uh, and I think their voice should be heard, uh, respected, and valued. I think considering the history of this country, and I had an opportunity to uh, work for the late great Congressman John Lewis, uh, who walked across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge uh, so that people would have a fundamental right to vote, uh, talked about that when people go to prison, they come out, uh, they should have their rights automatically uh, restored. They've paid their debt back to society and they are contributing members to the community and their voices are important. And so um, I think that in the state of Connecticut, that's no different, that we should ensure that everyone have an opportunity and access to the ballot box to vote their conscience. So voting is not our only kind of issue for reentry as a mechanism. Um, under the current law, the Department of Corrections and the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, commissioners must ensure that incarcerated individuals possess a state issue ID card or a license if they request it, and they have to qualify for it um, and pay the associated fees with it. So my first question is, why is this so important that when someone leaves um, prison that they have these documents? And then the second follow-up to that is going to be, there is a bill that is sitting in the, the state legislature this session that would alter it a little bit and kind of get rid of the fees, and you don't have to request it anymore. So my second kind of question would be, um, where do we see this going? How important is this? Um, maybe why, why was it even being talked about? So it's a couple-part answer. First, why, why is this even important? And then second, what do we think of this proposed amendment? Well, I'm not in the legislature right now, so I don't have, I don't have a major impact, but I do have an opinion. <laughs> so, um, of course I know, and all of us know how important an ID is, but I had no, no idea until I had a bag that was stolen. And so my ID is in the bag. And so I go to the bank to say my bag is stolen, but they want my ID. I don't have an ID. I go to DMV so I can get a driver's license, but they want my ID. I don't have an ID. So everyone wants an ID, but no one will give me uh, an, an ID. And so I believe it would just be a gesture of goodness, a gesture of hands up, you get out, you automatically get an ID because you can't get an apartment, you can't get anywhere, you're not gonna get anywhere to work until you're able to identify yourself. So I'm not part of the legislature right now, but uh, I do have an opinion. Yeah, no, no, I would say that, you know, this ID issue is very important. Uh, when I was working in the state of Florida, that's one of the first things that I was able to help institute in the state is to ensure that when individuals got out of prison that they had an ID in hand. And folks were saying, well, why is that important? Well, it's important because in order for folks to get a job, you got to have an ID. In order for you to get a driver's license, you need some form of state ID. In order for you to open up a bank account, you need a form of ID. In order for you to get an apartment, you need an ID. So an ID is crucial uh, in pretty much every facet and aspect of life, you need identification. And I think that this particular bill is going to ensure that that happens. I know right now in the uh, city of Bridgeport, uh, we have what we call the mayor's um, office on reentry affairs. Uh, that office help individuals that come back into the community um, get things like ID. And we've partnered with uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles and I think that this is the first uh, program within the state of Connecticut that has happened in terms of that partnership happening through Bridgeport and the uh, Motor Vehicle uh, Department to ensure that uh, individuals who are returning home to Bridgeport, which are about 1,000 people annually, 
receive an ID and we help to pay for those individuals to receive that identification. I think with this bill, it's going to help um, municipalities, especially with people returning home, um, have the uh, appropriate funding to give people um, to have a hand up when they get out. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, th th they're both correct. You, I am not in favor of, of uh, eliminating people's criminal histories, as I said earlier. But when somebody gets out of prison, I'm certainly not in favor of creating barriers for them to get their life back on track. And that is a barrier. You can't, you can't do anything without an ID. And the cost is ridiculous. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's a function of government. You know, you, you, we, we, the government, have decided that this individual has committed a crime, and we're going to sentence them to jail. We're going to pay for their meals, their lights, their heat, all that stuff the entire time they're incarcerated. And we're going to balk at $15 or $20 to give them ID to make sure they can get on the right track. That is a function of government and government should bear the cost. So the, the last topic that I want to touch on tonight is something that we have talked about a little bit, which is kind of the flip side of it, right? Not necessarily the offenders or the community, but those who do protect and serve. So I want to talk about um, a recent story in USA Today. They had, their story was on the mental health of first responders. And in that story, they noted that police officers and firefighters are more likely to die from suicide than in the line of duty. So some of the questions that I have surrounding this is, you know, especially maybe to you, Representative, since you, are, you do serve, um, what is it that kind that plays into the statistic? What can be done to change it? And then the second part of that is the bill that is in the state legislature right now uh, for 911 dispatchers. A lot of times they hear those calls and then they never necessarily know the follow up. Um, and they're not also in Connecticut. Something I didn't know was that they're not considered first responders. They don't have the same benefits and um, assistance that and resources that police and firefighters have. So I'm just, I want to kind of close on that note, uh, talking about those who serve and in this environment, how do we make sure that they are okay, both mentally, and then how do we help protect our 911 dispatchers? Okay, so there's a few things there. Uh, first off, we don't actually define first responder in statute here. That's one of the underlying issues when it comes to, to the dispatchers. Uh, one of the big things that they like to talk about um, in the legislature when we talk about this bill is police officers and firefighters have what they call portal to portal, where if I leave work, if I leave home to head to work, I'm covered under workers' compensation, comp workers compensation on my travel in and whatnot because of, of my demand to work. And dispatchers want to be included in that because they're called into work in varying weather conditions, et cetera. And I agree with them. They should be called, they should be considered in that. Um, everybody who works it as a first responder um, is, is going to be subject to s some significant mental health things. Um, I've said it earlier and I've said it many times in my life, police officers and live in the worst 10 minutes of everybody's day all day every day. Um, I'll take um, heroin overdoses as an example. You know, going to a heroin overdose and seeing a young person who died far too young um, is tr traumatic enough. Um, I don't think that folks realize at, at a heroin overdose, as an example, as a detective, I may be there four or five hours dealing with a family with, with a deceased family member there before the medical examiner's office shows up. Sometimes it takes that long. Uh, that wears on you. Um, and I could go on and on about all of the, you know, the destruction that we see, the devastation that we see, um, and it's, it, it weighs on you and, and your, your parking garage for that gets full. I think one of the best ways to handle it, um, I, I think police officers are by nature the helpers. Um, they don't like to be the helpies. And really, our officers, we've got to break that stigma. Uh, I don't know that it'll ever happen, um, but we need to. And I hope folks will take a minute to realize that police officers are people. And we lose tr track of that, right? It's a uniform, it's a car, it's a badge, it's a profession, it's the police this, the police that. You know, we'll have the police carry this, carry that. Well, they have backs and hips. How much you want them to carry? You know, they're people. And I think that inherently we lose sight of that. But I'll say this to you. I think that police officers sometimes lose fact that the public are people because it's like, well, the public or the motorist or the operator, right? We, we, we um, deperson, uh, uh, these dehumanize um, certain things when we start doing that in training or whatever. And we got to be careful about that too. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we're all people. And I think that whether it's Senator Gaston or Dr. Stallworth or you in the university or any of us, I think we all want the same thing. Uh, I think we want all of the, the members of this state to be happy and healthy and collaborative and working together. 
um, and sometimes they just disagree about the best way to get there. Um, but I, I thank you for that. So as our show closes, I want to also say thank you both for your public service, both in Hartford and in your communities, and as a law enforcement officer, as pastors. Um, Dr. Stallworth, thank you for serving as faculty. Um, and to our audience, I hope that our discussion tonight on criminal justice reform was informative. If there is one takeaway that we can have, it is that there's still a lot of work to be done. But while the criminal justice system might not be perfect, we can continue, continuously work toward making it more perfect to echo our preamble. So thank you panelists, State Senator Gaston, State Representative Howard, and Dr. Stallworth for your insights on this important discussion and your candor. Um, this has been a production of Connecticut Public's Cutline in the Community. The Fairfield University Master of Public Administration program would like to thank you in our studio audience and you for tuning in. I am Dr. Gail Alberta. Take care. Mm -hmm.